Down to the final two minutes of trading. Dow under pressure off just around 140 points. S&P and NASDAQ, though, holding on to gains. Francis Stacy, Optimal Capital's Director of Strategy, and Jay Jacobs, Goldblex ETF Senior Vice President and Head of Research and Strategy, are joining us today. Jay, let me go to you first, because the buying action we're seeing today, S&P and NASDAQ, both moving to the upside. Technology is an outperformer here. When we take a look at the sector action, how would you sum up today's buying? Because it's simply the total opposite of what we saw yesterday. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a buying of the dip situation. We're in a little bit of this weird middle ground where earnings is pretty much over. And now we're starting to turn our heads towards Black Friday and seeing how strong the consumer is in the United States. So we expect this to be a pretty quiet period. And right now, it seems like it's mostly technicals of people buying the dip. Does we'll see whether or not we'll see any follow through tomorrow. All right, let's take a look at where things stand here in the final few seconds of trading. Again, sector wise, technology is outperforming alongside materials. Taking a look at the Dow, though, the Dow under pressure once again today, off just over 160 points. Disney, Visa, Honeywell, Cisco, and 3M are the worst performers in the Dow. All right, there you go. We're putting a fork in it on this Thursday. One more day left in the trading session for the week. Let's see what's going on. We got the Dow off about 158 points. S&P 500 uh, up uh, just barely, up a little bit over two and a half points. NASDAQ up 81, almost 82 points. Let's get back to the panel and talk about where we're headed from here. And, you know, uh, Francis, you've pointed out that there's greater than $4 trillion dollars on the sidelines in regards to savings. Help us understand why that money might get deployed, especially when we just got the data from the Federal Reserve, which shows that household debt, and I realize a great portion of this is really mortgages, but household debt went up and it included more credit card spending. So if we got cash in the bank, why are we using the credit cards? And what does that mean for companies as we're looking at their bottom line? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're flush with liquidity still. And the thing is, is that, uh, you know, people are just spending more in general. I mean, that with the catalyst of the fact that we've seemed to have had a peak in the Delta virus cases. And, you know, we didn't get hit as far as earnings go as hard in the uh, third quarter as we might have imagined. And yet still, we're probably going to have an acceleration to the upside, given the cash available to spend, given the holiday period coming up interested to be seeing retail sales uh, data coming in. Um, but people have money to spend and people just as corporations are absorbing this sort of inflationary stuff with pushing prices through to consumers, consumers, their assets are elevated. Those that participate in the stock market, obviously this is disproportionately hard on those that don't, are willing to absorb these costs and are ready to spend. The savings rates are high. Um, and. So we're going to probably have an acceleration, uh, you know, a reacceleration from the third quarter to the fourth quarter. And so that's just what's and, and credit card debt being up. That's also more spending until, you know, you have problems in credit markets. Jay, how long, though, are companies going to be able to pass those higher prices along to the consumer? Because Francis makes a good point. Consumers are absorbing the higher prices now. But is this something that you expect to continue here into next year? I think it's likely, and a lot of that is being driven by the strength of the labor market. So companies you know, really don't have a choice in this competitive environment to pass through some of that pricing to consumers. Consumers will be comfortable with it if, these, if they see that their wages are going up or that oil prices are coming down or that they're able to continue to borrow at very low rates. So this trend likely isn't going to reverse for a while. And passing through those higher costs is going to be very key to these companies meeting their, you know, what I think is going to be pretty high earnings expectations after Q4. Francis, um, when we talk about passing on these extra costs to consumers, I just, I'm not bragging here, but we got a new TV coming into this house tomorrow, and it was on sale big time, and it's a, it's a brand new, you know, it's not last year's model. So my question is, yes, food costs more, we're seeing the inflation, but we're bringing the Black Friday deals forward. This is a company that started doing Black Friday stuff, that's why we bought the TV early. And are we going to see discounts? I mean, do the companies uh, are, are the, the companies actually have margins where they can discount when they might not need to? 
Well, tech balance sheets are particularly uh, healthy. There's a lot of cash on tech balance sheets. I think what it becomes is because your food costs are going up and those are sort of necessary expenditures, um, the sort of unnecessary expenditures or the discretionary, the consumer discretionary, uh, they may have to discount to further incentivize people to, uh, you know, it, they're now competitors with food and gas and other things. And so people who you know, their gas prices have gone up, their food prices have gone up, maybe they're spending a little bit less on Christmas this year, or people that didn't participate in the stock market rally or what have you, or people that, you know, their stimulus checks have run out, their um, unemployment benefits have run out. You've got to appeal to that wide swath of people. And so the tech sector, because of the health of the balance sheets, they're able to do that. And so I think we will see some of that, you know, in particularly in the discretionary, um, we'll see some discounts coming into the holiday, which which helps since everything else is up. And Jay, when you take a look at the higher prices, inflation, obviously a huge concern here for investors. A lot of people are just trying to figure out what exactly this means for the Fed, the pace of tapering that we're going to see, when we could potentially see a rate hike. What's your timeline just in terms of when you're expecting the Fed to move more aggressively? Well, I think there's uh, a lot of frustration in the market that inflation continues to exceed expectations, and there just doesn't seem to be a huge amount of motivation in the Fed to really address it. So that timeline is being pulled further and further forward. Could it be you know, mid-year next year? I think that's looking pretty likely at this point. I mean, any interest rate increases are going to be pretty minimal and slow over time, but just that indication from the Fed that we could see rising rates in 2022, I think will show that indication that they're really trying to fight inflation, uh, as well as waiting to see how transitory it really is. If it starts to solve itself by mid-year next year, it would also obviously alleviate the problems in a way that the Fed doesn't really have to deal with. Um, Jay, I wanted to follow up on something because we've had on the uh, president of Lithium Americas, uh, was on with us last week. And this is something that you're advising people to pay attention to, not just lithium, but the EV landscape. Tell us more about why you think, despite supply chain issues, this is a place to consider put some of the maybe $4 trillion that Francis is talking about. Jay, what do you think? Well, there's a few things going on this year. First is about 7% of cars sold around the world are going to be electric this year. This is a huge increase from last year of only about 3%. Uh, it, still smell, it still sounds like small numbers, but we're talking about millions of cars are now electric. You couple that with the infrastructure bill, which is going to add about seven times more EV charging stations around the United States. That basically alleviates some of the range anxiety that people have. It means that batteries and EVs can be smaller, which thereby makes EVs cheaper. So we really think this is an inflection point for EV adoption. What people are kind of missing is, you know, they're talking about Tesla, they're talking about Rivian and Lucid and Nikola. What they don't realize is the OPEC behind EVs, and that's the lithium miners and the battery producers. About five companies are in the world control, you know, well over two thirds of lithium production. They're the ones that hold the keys to the energy sector going forward as we shift to battery electric. Jay Jacobs and Francis Stacey, always great to uh, speak with both of you. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us.